Let's, let's pray and, uh, and we'll get started tonight. Father, we come before you tonight, Lord. We thank you, uh, Father, for your blessings today, Lord. We thank you, Father, that we have this opportunity, Lord. I know that there are many, many more people who wanted to be here tonight and uh, the, the weather has kept them at home. Father, I pray that somehow we would be able to record this in a way that we can show it to them. And, and uh, but Lord, I pray that if anybody's making their way here now, I pray that you give them, uh, help them arrive safely, Lord. And then as we make the presentation, Father, I just pray that you begin to speak to our hearts. Lord, I know that there's, this is something we've talked about for a long time in this church. And Father, we're just going to trust you, trust you with uh, uh, the planning of it process of it, the, the, the uh, financial resources that we need to do this, the, the relationships that we will have uh, with, with uh, different people as we go into this project. Lord, we're, we're just asking you to guide us all. And Father, that this would be something that all of us would be proud of and enjoy, uh, that, that Lord, that it would be pleasing to you and that it would help us. Uh, in some small way reach our community better. So Lord, now that we go into this presentation, I pray that you uh, guide it and, and lead us in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so the committee's been working uh, at, at uh, some proposals and some ideas and, and so forth, and tonight what we're ready to do is give to you a presentation. And here to give that presentation and to try to answer as many questions as we might have uh, is uh, Stan Robertson. He is the uh, president of uh, the uh, architect company that we've been talking uh, to, uh, and the name of the company is Halo. Um, and they are here uh, in, in Lubbock, located, they got an office here. And so Stan's gonna come and he's gonna make his presentation. And after he's done, we'll, uh, we'll entertain any questions that you may have. Stan, would you come join us? Thank you, sir, for being here tonight. Testing, testing. Okay. Can y'all hear me? All right. Okay. As Pastor mentioned, um, the church approached Halo Architects uh, to come in and uh, talk to the congregation uh, about um, what are possibilities of what we can actually do with the worship center. Um, Halo Architects, uh, well, the other thing they wanted me to do, of course, was come in and introduce you to who Halo Architects is. Um, Halo Architects is uh, a company located here in Lubbock, headquartered in Lubbock. We have offices also in Austin, Texas. And some people know us as basically church planning and design architects. We work all over the country uh, planning and designing churches. Um, I don't know if uh, some of you know my dad. My dad's a Baptist pastor. Uh, he was the pastor at College Heights Baptist for 25 years in Plainview. And of course, before that, I was moving all over the country with his pastorate. So uh, I lived in a bunch of different little towns until he finally moved to Plainview, uh, which I moved there when I was a sophomore. So everybody in our organization is somehow affiliated with a background of church going and service. And so it's kind of very unique about our company and what we do, because if you can think about it, if you're an architect and a planner and you're just working with churches, you better be ready to travel or you're not going to be able to make a living. <laughs> so we basically have been jet setting for a long time now. Um, Halo Architects has been going since 1998. Um, serving all kinds of capacities uh, church-wise. Um, so on this particular project, and as we're consulting Redbud Baptist on what the possibilities might be with renovating an interior space, and in this case, we're talking about the worship center, um, I would be the project manager on this. Uh, Luke Quaby, which is another Plainview boy, he got his master's degree at Texas Tech. He would be your project architect. My dad, if the church is wanting to go through a capital campaign uh, process, then my dad can consult on that, and he runs our campaign consulting area of this. And then Scott Harvey is actually our construction manager. Uh, we are a design build firm, which means not only do we plan and design the church, but the entire time we're designing a church and planning for what we're going to do, 
we have a construction manager running the project budget or construction estimate budget the entire time we're working. And at that point, when it comes time to break ground, we can also build the project. Now, another thing that's unique about us is you don't have to hire any of us. <laughs> It's a la carte, uh, meaning some churches will say, hey, we already have a contractor, and so what we'll do is we'll fill in the pieces that the church does not have, and we'll knock Scott Harvey off the services part of it. Um, if you don't need a capital campaign consultant, if you've already got one, then naturally you can take that out of our package as well. Okay? So here are the three areas that we serve um, and it, the most common and frequent things that the churches actually ask of us. Um, first of all, court sh uh, church planning and design. A lot of times we'll go into churches, they don't even know what they need. They have an idea of what they want. They just don't know what they need based on their um, how many people go to church there, how they're engineering their ministries, um, what they're wanting to actually put more resources into certain ministries. And so we'll sit down with them, work out plans, and start applying those to actual floor plans. Um, in this case, we know what we're working with. It is a worship center. So uh, everything that we're talking to your committee about right now and the church leadership, it's about this space. Um, capital campaign consulting and marketing. If you've seen 3D renderings, you know, right now on HGTV, everybody's, uh, everybody's familiar now with what we call pre-visualization services, three-dimensional photorealistic renderings and animations. Um, our company is actually one of the oldest companies in the nation that have been producing those. We produced them for television networks and everything else under a company that we owned. Um, and so we applied that to architectural design starting in 1998, so quite a while back. Um, design build, that's our latest piece to our A to Z service portfolio. Basically, if we were able to help a church plan and design it, we were helping them raise money for it, we were helping them visualize it, then naturally they were all asking us, hey, can you build it? And so we did add that piece literally just two years ago. So to give you an idea where we have worked, um, and I don't even really think this is the most accurate map anymore because uh, we've knocked off Nevada and Utah and Washington and Montana. Uh, so um, we've actually worked in, as you can see, a lot of this, uh, the actual states in, in the Union. Um, and uh, really, uh, like I said, we've been traveling since we started the company, um, and I've been on a plane going and actually helping churches uh, visualize what it is they actually wanted to present to their congregations. So this is a church in Detroit, Michigan, um, just as an example. And then interiors, we do everything from traditional interiors to very contemporary interiors. Again, we don't come in and tell you what your church needs to be or look like. We come in and ask questions and we throw a bunch of information on the table for your leadership and your committees to actually provide feedback to us on telling us what the DNA is of this specific church. What will work with this church, what will not work with this church. This church again, so went from Detroit, so east side of the Union. This is Indian Wells, California. This is Southwest Community Church. Basically, it's a um, about a six building conglomerate of uh, space and you have everything from video venues to youth buildings to children buildings on and on. I think the total square footage on that was like 560,000 square feet total because there's three stories on a lot of these buildings that you're looking at right there. But everything from reflecting pools, student union or student life centers and then um, course what we ever have to do to make the church look good from the street. Now naturally you're not interested in talking to us about all those projects. Um, West Texas uh, is where we have focused for the last three years now. 
in trying to do what we did all over the nation. I've got two boys that are in high school. I'd really like to stay here and not be on jets flying all over the place right now. So um, God's blessed us with the fact that we've had quite a few projects here in West Texas and I haven't been doing as much jet setting. So here's an example I think some of you might be familiar with, but here in Lubbock, um, the old skating, uh, skating rink is the top view. Um, we turned that into Harvest Christian Fellowship, which is on the lower image there. So basically stripped the pre-engineered metal building and gave it a new facelift, both inside and outside. So if you can imagine, that was the skating rink. And now that's what it looks like inside the worship center. Um, naturally, the ceiling sloped down in really odd areas, and so we had to be creative with where we put the stage, where we put a lot of the actual seating and so forth. This is the lobby when you walk in. That's the entry into the children's ministry, and the bottom right uh, slide is their youth center. Um, I said that my dad was pastor at Plainview. Uh, he leaves, and then Plainview decides, hey, now that that guy's gone, we can hire his son to come in and renovate the church. Um, so what this was, this image is actually um, used to be just a hallway. And it was classrooms, three classrooms on the left, one classroom on the right. And what they needed was area for adults to mingle, uh, what we call connect space. Um, as well as they needed an opportunity to very easily communicate to visitors where the children's check-in area was and where the guest services center was. And so we turned that area, which was pretty much their Grand Central Station point, it was a point where a lot of different traffic patterns met and it just created a huge bottleneck originally with the hallway system. And so we opened it up and gave them this kind of uh, environment. So these are just some examples of uh, what we've done, what we do, what we love to do. I mean, if you can imagine helping a church solve some problems that they have or that they're seeing that they have and how they operate on a Sunday morning or Sunday evening or even on Wednesdays with different ministries. Uh, it could be the adult ministries, the youth ministries, or it could just actually be the worship center. And that's what we're wanting to talk about today. So uh, church leadership has met with us two, three times. So three times. And really what it's been is just a session where we're asking questions, trying to find out what is feasible, what is needed, and what we came uh, down to was a list of things within the worship center that we might be able to address. And uh, that's what we want to talk to you about tonight. Um, just to give you an idea, you're going to see here that it says scope of work, phase one, sanctuary remodel. Um, naturally, there were some other things that we talked about that could be done in the future. New lobby, uh, new entry into this space. Um, goodness, uh, what else did we talk about? We talked about brand new audio visual systems, new lighting systems in here, um, cloud ceilings to control some of the acoustical value in here, um, all the way to new lobby out in that area. And so there was quite a bit discussed. Um, again, knowing that uh, every church has a huge laundry list of things that they want to do. And so what we have to do is, of course, look at that, balance that with a budget, and start thinking about what is realistic in the near term and then how do we design it in a way that you can still do the laundry list of items after that without handcuffing you and uh, if we design something now that doesn't allow you to do those future expansions and, and uh, renovations then we're not helping you out any. So we're trying to put a lot of brain power behind this, thinking about, okay, what can we do that basically just accentuates the entire plan over a 10, 15 year period? So we're talking about the near term plan is to do something in this space. So the three things that I've written down here is a remodel of this stage area. Um, it is new paint in throughout this space and it is new carpet in this space as well. Okay, now um, you're going to see some sub notes here, but the uh, remodeling of the stage, what that is, is it's going, uh, the plan is to give you more square footage on the stage, um, basically with wings that come out 
and getting rid of the tiered uh, platform back here, allowing you to handle choir or cantatas, Easter, Christmas, whatever it may be, in a different fashion that other churches are doing so that they make this more of a multi-purpose space up here as a platform. Okay, there's a lot of ways to skin that cat. Um, the other thing we're planning on doing is we're going to get rid of everything that pretty much dates this stage. So we're going to make it more contemporary. The speaker cage back there, um, we'll talk about the baptistry. But the idea is to make this a lot more sleek. Um, something that's going to be more visually uh, appropriate for today's technology. Uh, audio visual systems now, you have a ton of options that can transform this space just by turning on lights. Okay? Um, to give you an example, I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna show you some examples here in a minute. But the idea is to give you something to where we can possibly do a dual screen system to where um, even a three screen system. Again, this is stuff that we will be talking to the church about and uh, finding out exactly what works for Redbud. But um, if you can imagine this space, the only thing that is going to be something that we really need to talk hard about, and that is the baptistry. What do we do with it? Okay. Um, I'm going to show you some examples of that as well. Um, hopefully one of those is an option for uh, what we can do here at Redbud. Uh, new paint throughout. Basically what we're wanting to do is give you a little bit more of a uh, palette that, that you kind of see in churches today. A little bit more contrast in some of the walls. You have accent walls now. You can have these sound boards. Uh, uh, there's just a lot of options on what we can do when it comes to actual color inside of a worship center. Okay, the other one is carpet. Now, if we talk about carpet, what else do we got to talk about? We got to talk about the pews. Um, so every church we work with, naturally, there's a bit of a struggle uh, when it comes to do we keep the pews, do we renovate them, or do we change these uh, to be stackable, cushioned chair seating? Um, I'm going to be working with the church and we'll work to make sure that everybody is informed and has really good information on why one might be better than the other. And again, it'll be the church's decision, not Halo Architect's decision. So there you go, Pastor. I just threw it right back on you. <laughs> um, but anyway, we know that that's something that has to be discussed. It's discussed in every church. Um, uh, naturally, you do need to think about what other churches are doing and uh, um, consider why they might have made some of the decisions they made because there's some very valid reasons why they make some of those decisions. Okay, And so we'll give you some case studies on that as well. Um, so that being said, uh, another church we've worked on here actually in Lubbock. Uh, does everybody know, have, have you all seen Aldersgate? Uh, it used to be Aldersgate Methodist Church out on Indiana and 98th Street right across from... Mm, uh, what's that uh, department store? Um, Coles. Coles. Very, very good. Coles and All Saints is tucked back there in that area, All Saints uh, High School. So uh, Aldersgate hired us to do the very thing that Red Bud's leadership has asked us to come in and talk to you about. Okay, that they wanted, this is their space. Um, can we turn some lights off? These will pop out. Yes. Yeah, yeah just make it as dark as. as it is standable out there. Because I don't want some of these to look really dark because that'll kind of give it a... Okay, so what you're looking at is you're looking at a wood-lined backdrop. You've got a ceiling grid ceiling. Now you guys have a nice ceiling, okay? It's vaulted. It goes way up there. That causes some issues with acoustics. And so that's stuff that we need to talk about. But this one, they had acoustical paneled ceiling tapered up towards the stage. And then they had a soffit that was dropped down, a drywall soffit. So you've got a wood-lined backdrop. There's a baptistry in the middle. Their stage was way too small for what they were wanting to do with their stage, which involved praise bands. But it also involved letting the community use their stage for some other stuff as well. Um, and then it never met the needs uh, for Easter cantata, Christmas cantata, and, and other uh, parts of the um, uh, praise um, uh, ministry that they had there at the church. 
uh, let's see here, blue cushioned chairs that didn't match anything in the worship center. Um, I think they were basically salvaged from what it used to be. And so naturally a church does what a church has to do in order to make these things um, happen. So this is what we designed. Um, so changed the chairs out, made them match, new carpet, new paint scheme throughout. We demoed their ceiling, put in ceiling clouds, put in LED lighting, and then the, we got rid of the baptistry area and basically gave them what we call a, a blank slate. Now what does that allow them to do? The audio visual system that they had, they wanted to be able to use the wing walls and you can see that there's the little spots on there, that's a light projected onto those walls. They can make that look like stained glass windows. They can basically, any photograph you see, you can project that onto the two wing walls. Okay, it's called environmental projection screens. Um, so we basically make this backdrop somewhat of a projection screen. Okay, make it something that's nice and clean that you can transform a space in a matter of just turning on a light um, to change the environment that's in here. To give you an idea of what that could be, it could be youth, praise and worship in here, and then in five minutes, they're ushered out, and now it's traditional church. And you just change the lighting scheme in here to make that happen, and everybody at that point feels like it was adapted to them specifically. Okay? Um, in this case, they went for three screens, and actually smaller screens. Again, this is a study we'll do with the church, finding out if you want three, if you want two. It's really just specific to that church and how they operate. To give you an idea of why they did this, is they would have, um, I think in this case, they had the two side screens that had the words for the, no, uh, the middle screen had the words to the music. The side screens played off of whatever sermon theme or that uh, a sermon series that might have been being had, they had other imagery that was on the two side screens in this particular case. Um, now, we expanded the size of the stage here as well. If you'll see this next slide, we've got a before and after. Um, you can't really see it in there, but let me go back a few slides here. If you look, I don't have my laser, but in the middle of the stage, they actually had stairs going up. And then they had two stairs on the side. Um, if you look at our design, they had basically worn that out, said they're not interested in that anymore. They wanted the two side stairs coming up. And so when we expanded the stage out, we took away the front stairs. Now what we do there now is we have temporary steps. So if there's a wedding, the chairs are changed, middle aisle, and they put in the temporary steps that uh, just basically you haul in, latch them down, and it operates very similar to any other staircase that you would see. Now again, we're shooting for something that is very versatile, something that is multi-use, and that can fill a lot of needs inside this space. What we try to do is make this space as usable during the week as it is even on Sunday mornings because it's such a space, it's not really space that you want to waste and just limit to one day a week of use. So there's that staircase that I was talking about. I could have just moved to the next slide and showed you what I was talking about there. But um, really narrow stage. Um, just again, they just could not get done what they needed to get done on that stage. This is another close up of what you're seeing with the wood paneling system and stuff. Um, and then of course, this is the design again. So if you can imagine this just being one solution to how you can make a stage multi-purpose and more contemporary. Um, you've got to understand that there's a lot of ways to do this, okay? This, just because I'm showing you this example does not mean this is the only way to make a stage more functional, more multi-purpose, and more adaptable to a more modern or contemporary audiovisual system, okay? Does everybody understand that? So I don't want anything to be considered concrete just because I'm showing you this does not mean this is what your committee and your leadership of the church has already talked to us about and this is the way it's going to be. 
Uh, we still got to go through this process. This was more of us just opening up um, some ideas, throwing some out on the table and showing you what we've done uh, here in Lubbock to solve some of the problems that other churches have asked us to come in and solve. So there's uh, before and after looking from one of the side views. And this is just taken from the audio booth. Uh, we've already talked to the church eventually. What will need to happen is naturally you'll want to regain that space that currently your audio visual is in. Usually if we did anything high off the floor like that, that would have been visual. Okay, so we can project and we can run lighting and other things like that from up there, but normally you would not want your audio booth up off the floor. The majority of your hot spots and hearing and needs are down on the floor, so that's where we would put our audio booth. There's a lot of ways to do that these days with technology, which we'll talk to the church about how that might be able to be done so that we're not having to include this in our phase one budget, because that, that costs quite a bit of money to make that kind of a change. But there's some good fixes that are out there uh, that a lot, uh, technology allows us to do that are feasible uh, when it comes to a, a tight budget. And so for a temporary time period, we would be able to operate uh, under that kind of system before we really tackle what's up in the balcony, okay? Okay, so those are the three areas. I mean, if I go back and forth between that image, again, if you go back and look, so remodeling of the stage, oh my goodness, sorry. New carpet. So if I go and look at that carpet, okay, so we're talking about new carpet in here. Again, we'll work with some people in the church coming up with color boards to decide on what we're going to do both in painting the walls as well as what selection we'll make in the new carpet. Now again, that alone, those two areas, that's going to drive what we do with the pews and or with the chairs, okay, because naturally we're going to color coordinate those and there's a lot of options on what we can do with chairs. There's one option we can do with pews. And again, we'll, we'll talk about that later um, as uh, the committee gets deeper into some of the studies with us. Okay, so any questions on the scope of the project at this point? Everybody understand what we're trying to work with? Okay. Okay. Now, just to clarify, phase one does not say anything about cloud ceilings or LED lighting. Not in this, okay, not in this scope, all right? There's a phase two that will address acoustical ceilings, lighting, um, and audio visual. Uh, when I say audio visual, I really mean moving that, regaining that space for seating, um, and moving that down at the lower level. What I do believe this includes, um, or will include, is adding projectors and the screens that are needed uh, to give you the dual screen system here. Okay? Any, Any questions, questions on that, that scope wise? Okay. Construction budget. Naturally, there's two ways to look at any construction budget. You're either telling Halo what you're willing to spend on a interior renovation, remo uh, or renovation, or you're telling us, hey, this is what we need to happen. Okay, those three things in the scope, and now you tell us what we're possibly looking at in order to make that happen. Um, there have been a few discussions about the church handling a few of the trades, for instance, carpet and painting rather than going through a contractor in this case which could be us again it hasn't been decided yet that you would use halo to build it but if you did naturally you can either add that to our scope or you can take it out of our scope i told the church we operate the same way as our services you can pull as much out of our scope as you want so right now the way i understand it with this budget that i'm showing here this takes care of all of the stage renovation that we're talking about doing. This includes carpet and this includes painting. Is that correct, Chuck? Is that correct? Did include carpet? Okay, something that I think is important to note that if it includes carpet, 
it means the church has to make a decision on whether or not you're doing pews or stackable chairs. Okay, you can't do one without the other. Okay, so 265,000 to 295,000. Um, right now, good luck estimating what things are going to cost. Um, there are contractors are really busy right now, and when I say contractors, what I really mean is subcontractors are really busy right now. So what's happening is you're getting subs that are just throwing a number at it, saying, "Man, I really don't need that work. Here, this is my bid. Um, if I get it, I'll figure out how to make it happen." If I don't get it, well, I didn't need the work anyway. Okay, so right now what's happening is prices are escalating pretty rapidly right now. Um, everything's coming in a little higher than what everybody's estimating. We have taken that into a factor here. Uh, we've estimated that. If you don't build this for another year or two years, naturally you have to add what we call an escalation charge on that. That does That's not in this, okay? We used today numbers to come up with uh, what we would estimate for construction right now. That's also why there's a range. This has not been hard bid. The reason it hasn't been hard bid is because we don't have drawings yet. You can't get that hard bid until drawings are actually produced and um, we get it out to subcontractors to look at so that they can get us accurate numbers. Okay? So right now this is a range that we would say to the church, this is what we would project that if we did a capital campaign, this is what we would be shooting for to raise this amount of money in order to uh, knock off this phase one scope of construction that we've uh, described here tonight. Okay, I believe, Pastor, that is it. Um, I, you want me to open up for questions? Okay, all right. Uh, and if there's anything you need to add, Chuck, that I might have missed or anything, just uh, make sure that uh, you tell me to voice it or you, you come up and I'll hand you the mic. Um, all right, so we're opening this up for questions at this point. So if you have questions about anything I said, we want to make sure everybody's very clear on every point, uh, especially scope and what's being uh, requested. Um, and then if you have any questions about how we solved some of the problems that uh, maybe Aldersgate uh, presented to us, I'll fill you in as much detail as I can on that. Um, we could start the question out with the, uh, with the baptistry, but um, if somebody else, uh, you all want me to go ahead and talk about baptistry? Okay. Uh, now, I, man, I'm Southern Baptist. I grew up Southern, Southern Baptist Church, so naturally there haven't been a whole lot of churches that uh, we haven't gone into uh, if they're traditional Baptist that uh, when it, we first sat down with them and told them what other churches were doing with their baptistry, they didn't just jump up and down and say, oh yeah, that's what we want to do. They had to go through a process of figuring out if that's the direction they wanted to uh, approach and actually direct a uh, architectural group uh, to design. To give you an example, Aldersgate did this very thing and they, and they struggled with it. They tried to decide, do we keep the baptistry and not get the function backstage that we want or do we get rid of the baptistry and come up with a solution that our congregation will like? Um, they went ahead and took the second approach. Um, I can tell you right now, there isn't a single person in the church who feels like they made a bad decision in removing the baptistry from the back of the worship center. Um, what they do is they bring in a, a baptistry when they have baptisms. What a lot of the churches are doing these days is um, they will, uh, let's say two people came forward in a two or three week period. Well, every quarter they will have a Sunday where they baptize people that have come forward over a certain period of time. Now, it's different with every church. Um, there have been some churches who uh, will do it every week. Uh, there are some churches who will do it every quarter, and then there are some churches that will do it every year. Um, we've had some churches who literally, depending on where they are geographically, they'll go down to the river and have services, and they will baptize once a year in the local river that's uh, going through town or in the neighboring county. Um, and they just do a church service there to do that. So they do make it more of a ritual uh, style um, uh, baptism. Uh, it, it's almost like you're having a banquet at the church. Uh, you're inviting all friends, family, and everything else. Now, Aldersgate, they do it, uh, I think they do it every quarter. 
But the idea is you bring that up, you only use that part of the stage on the Sunday that you're doing baptisms. Every other Sunday and every other day of the week that that stage is being used, the whole stage is being used for whatever venue that is and ministry that is that is using it for that, that uh, um, particular event. Okay? They literally pull a water hose in and fill up that trough. There's heaters on those portable uh, baptismals and they heat the water for that Sunday, that Sunday morning, they drain it the same way. There's a hose that you hook up to it and you just siphon it straight out a back door in a lot of cases. So what, what, why, the reason I'm saying that is I'm not knocking that. What I'm telling you is that church saved money on all the plumbing that it typically takes to remove or move a baptistry. Um, brand new churches that we design for to $10 million, they're designing them without baptistries these days. Um, they do portable baptistries. Okay? Now there are a couple of churches that we work for, they're not going to do away with the baptistry. We just did a Church of Christ in Artesia, New Mexico. They're not doing away with baptistry. As a matter of fact, they told us, how do we fill that up in three minutes? <laughs> so, so we came up with a solution for how they fill that up in three minutes. The reason I say that, we're not going to tell you how Redbud Baptist Church is going to handle baptisms, okay? What we do want you to do is think about that, all right? Think about how other churches are handling baptisms in their church and what they're giving up to have the more traditional design baptismals right in the back of the worship center or on the stage which is typically considered really valuable real estate these days in a church. Um, especially if it's a church that does a lot of praise uh, band stuff, praise team, um, Easter cantata, Christmas cantata. I mean, the stage is really um, where you're going to gain the majority of your really valuable real estate for those types of venues. Okay. Uh, okay. So that explanation of what we're doing with baptismals uh, may have spurred another question. So again, we're back open to questions. Yes, sir. Um, what did we estimate this to be? Was it uh, six to eight feet? So six to eight feet this way, and that's going to help us determine if we take any space out. There's a possibility if we gain a full six to eight feet that direction, then we don't even have to push this out any further. So then we just talk to you about how you want the front of the stage designed. Do you want it walled off like this with two access points on the wings? Or do you want altar style steps all the way around and that type of thing? But that's a process that we would go through with you to make sure that we're designing it the way you want it. And uh, we do predict naturally the platform would continue where you currently see the piano and the organ right now. We would wrap this stage around those wing walls at that point. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. We create a wall where you see the current CMU block wall and where there's openings, we would be creating a wall there that would become the backdrop here. And then, are you talking about the, bat, the, the changing rooms and all of that? The plan right now is to figure out a way to gain access to that and use it for storage. Because at this point, the changing rooms in a lot of cases are going to be, you have these two side wall or side entryways. The majority of the churches that we're working for that do baptismals with the mobile baptismal is people will, the person being baptized when the prayer is being had, they walk right up here. There's a person with a towel, literally, just waiting for the person to get out. They wrap them up and walk them. Usually there's a, a temporary screening uh, screen there and they just walk them back out of the worship center. So we, what I'm saying with that is we do not need the changing rooms in that case. Changing would be done in a room somewhere outside of this space. Um, one example could be it could be being done uh, in the choir room, which is behind here as well. Uh, again, we just got to find some separation and how to partition things off to make that work. That 
Yes, sir. Um, usually the budgets that we do, uh, and, and again I'll have to be more detailed on exactly what it covers, usually the budgets on the construction budget handle everything except for fixtures, furnitures, and equipment. So F, 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 and E is usually what they call that. So projectors would be part of the fixtures, furniture, and equipment budget. That is not in this number. Okay, so this is purely the construction area minus F, F, and E. All right. Well, that's where we have to discuss. You can get that carpet budget to work with either pews or chairs. You just got to make the decision because there's no going back after you make that decision when it, whether it's pews or chairs. Yes, sir. Yes, it can. Yes, yeah. Basically, if we do the more contemporary backdrop, what it's going to do is open up the door for you to handle your projection system in a lot of different ways. One, you can just project up to the two screens that will be flanking the stage. Another option is you can do use what they call environmental projection, which means there's a projector, or basically three of them, that are back there and all they do is they wash your back wall to make it look like anything you want it to look like. Um, we've seen churches use that to transform a space on one service, a traditional service, in a service 45 minutes later, a contemporary service. And that's all just with lighting and projections. Any other questions? I'm sorry, I can't hear I can't hear him. Baptistry? Yes. So if I heard you right, you're asking what kind of negatives have we heard when we've been trying to make a decision on whether or not to include a baptistry in the design or not. Is that correct? Yes. Yes. The, the, the first one that comes to mind when people are talking about pro or con is naturally it's more work to have a baptistry, a mobile baptistry put up on stage. You're moving some of your praise equipment. Um, you're having to run a tarp, a, typically a plastic tarp along here so that you're not getting the, the stage wet around that because people are going to be climbing in and out of that. Um, you've got several volunteers that need to be there in that process because you have people with towels that will wrap a person up after they step out. You've got to have your side wing temporary screening walls just so that you're not seeing them, you know, as they wrap up and walk out. You're not wanting to see that part of it. You just want to see them being baptized up and out and the next person in being baptized up and out and then vice versa. So a lot of the transitional stuff is happening behind those screen walls. And usually when I say a screen wall, it's just a curtain typically that's so high, black curtain, and it basically ushers them out the door in the back. So really it's the setup. It's the idea of somebody thinking, man, I've got to fill that, and they'll call it a trough. <laughs> I've got to fill the trough up and then I've got to drain it. So it's mainly maintenance. It's really just the setup and breakdown of that, of that particular event at the church. Other churches will sit there and say, well, that is better than 
uh, not gaining the space that the baptistry is taking up in the back of the worship center. What you're seeing a lot these days in contemporary churches is where are they designing the baptistry? Sides. Yes. Here. Now this one, we've done several. Now this one, they actually, this is the Church of Christ I was talking about. They did keep their, oh. oh. Ah. Well, anyway, they did keep their baptistry in the middle, but we basically created a, um, still a backdrop that had stone, uh, uh, cultured stone capping, and some other stuff at the back that made it still something that was a presentation. We could do that same thing. We, we've done a very similar design with no baptistry. So there's still something to look at, and there's a wainscot of material, okay, or a water table of material, but then you still also design in a feature that still allows you to do uh, environmental projection screens and other things like that. So there's a way to bridge the gap between both of those. Now, the baptistry, how often is that used? Correct. So, um, and that is not in the renovation budget, okay? So when was the last time any of you have been back there and walked through that area back there? Okay. You do what? Okay, all right, very good. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Right. Yeah, and that, that's exactly how we operated. Uh, one week, profession of faith. The next week, we were baptized. That, that's how I was baptized. What's happening now is they are creating these baptismal events. And you're seeing less and less of the being baptized. Now, this Church of Christ, it was, if you walk up there, you're getting dunked <laughs> that day. That's why they wanted to fill it up three minutes. But um, that's going to be... That's going to be the church making that decision. On, But it takes some research to make that decision. Just because you and I were baptized one week after doesn't mean we make a decision based on something like that, based on what you and I knew. Um, because that has changed. Now again, it's not for me to make that decision for Redbud. It's going to be Redbud making that decision. But you need to know that there are tons of examples out there. Okay? How churches are making things work to become more multi-purpose in a space rather than very specific use in square footage that can only be used for that one thing. Yes, sir. Absolutely. Absolutely. We do that as well. And the gentleman in the back. So naturally, there's pros and cons to every solution we will present associated with the baptistry. And what I mean by that is, so we, he just asked the question about putting a baptistry in the stage. If we're renovating the stage, and this is a, this is a wood stage, so it'd be easy to do that in this stage. But then what are you faced with? Well, what kind of lid do you put on that? And how much weight does that lid bear? Okay, so there's a lot of things that we do. We do those probably 40% of the time in the stage, all right? Um, but now you gotta figure out a system that will allow a person to lift that lid, and then where do you tuck that lid? And then when you're doing the service, when does that lid come back on? Well, usually during the prayer. Some men will come out and they'll put that lid back down. It's not one piece of material. You have to do it in several pieces of material because it gets too heavy when it's just one piece of material. We've done pneumatic uh, covers, 
that you push a button and that thing starts rolling back just like it would on a really nice hot tub, okay? Um, naturally, higher budget. Um, so really, just what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to think about the budget and the amount of money that can be spent. We're going to need to think about what the new generation expects from a Baptist church when it comes to professions of faith and how much time it, they expect to be, uh, that it would take between the time they come up, profess their faith, to the time that they get baptized. Um, all I'm telling you is you, we do the research on that and as a church make the decision on how best to use the stage area, baptistry area. Okay? But it can be moved. But if you move it, we got to move plumbing. So dollars start going up. If we move it to the left or to the right, more plumbing, dollars start going up. Um, so right now, in that budget that I'm showing you, that is removing the actual baptistry. Not telling you that's what we're going to do, but I'm just telling you that's the way it's originally been thought. Again, there have been no drawings produced at this point. Um, so uh, it's just thoughts at this point. Yes? So you're saying also that if we were to leave it in the middle, that you would be able to create that sleek look Yes. Yes, right. So you're saying bring some earth quality stone or something to that? We can do that with what you have right here, yes. We would basically strip all of the ornament and go more contemporary with a backdrop here, basically at the same location that you currently have your wall system here. But that would then mean that we're still addressing the stage on the wings and we would be pushing out at that point, taking some square footage off of here. Again, we still don't know how much because we really haven't talked to the leadership on exactly what happens on stage square footage wise. But we would assume that we would be pushing out if we lose those six feet to eight feet that we were thinking about grabbing, then naturally that means we would have to come out into the floor a little bit more. But that's, that's an option. It's doable. You're saying keeping those baptistry rooms, changing rooms back there, and what if we were to keep the baptistry there, but use this space like you were saying for storage, and then the side? Well, um, if we kept that, basically that structural system right there, I mean, we, we have options on what we can do there. We would need to um, just make sure everybody knows there's still no uh, accessibility standards being met to get people into the baptistry. It, on our budget, we, hadn't, we basically had not talked about refinishing that. I agree with you. If we keep it, it needs to be redone and, and made more modern and contemporary. Um, but yeah, we would get rid of the majority of the ornamentation that you see here, and we would handle the doors in a different way, almost like they would disappear in, into a back system, into a paneling system. Like you see some of the nice sub-zero refrigerators and things like that. Not to use a better example than a refrigerator door, but uh, some of them you can't tell are actual refrigerators. Yes, ma'am. Our team would still figure out all the systems to make all of that work. We wouldn't be losing access from the platform level into the backstage area. You would still have that. But it would be my guy's job to figure out how best to make that happen. Ramp. ramp. If it's going to be ADA accessible, it's got to climb um, an inch every 12 feet. So if you or one foot, you've got a 12 foot ramp. So if you talk about the height from floor to the baptistry level, you don't have enough room back there for switchbacks and length of a ramp to get up to that level. Correct, it would start in the parking lot. That's exactly right. You see ramps? The ramp for the stage, not the 
Okay, even the stage, we, we can definitely do that. We do that all over the place. But even this stage, um, 14, 21, 28, almost uh, 30 inches high. So you're looking at um, 30 feet uh, of ramp. Um, with this auditorium, if you stay with this auditorium, this is probably about the right height you would want to keep it at. Um, and the way we judge that is just back seats. If you continued stackable chairs all the way back, you're thinking about the um, what we call sight lines to the back seat faces. This would be about the right height you would want your stage to be at. Good rule of thumb on that is 65 feet back. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> really? Um, did they uh, see? Here's the thing with those. Nowadays, they're making them very similar to the fiberglass uh, baptistries, where if it's a if it's one where the person sits down, w w was uh, a she or he? Was it a she? Was she sitting down? She wasn't sitting down. Okay, they're making them now where. Okay, they're making them now where the majority of them have seats in them, and the person sits down, and that seat is adjustable based on the age or the size of the person, so that they're up plenty high over the rim of that, and then they get baptized back. And the pastor's, of course, outside of that uh, baptistry when he leans them back. They're, what I'm saying is, there's all kinds of different ones, but they're, it's amazing. They're all priced about the same, and there are some good ones, and then there are some that are not so good. But that might have solved that type of problem. Now, if it's just the difference in them being in the middle of the stage and being over on the side at a lower level, then, now that's different. If that's an issue, that's, that's going to be an issue. Right. Yes. 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 Right. Yes. Right. 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 Yes. Something you got to think about. They could. Yes. Something else you need to think about. It's just when they do it back there, nobody sees it. <laughs> you just hear it. <laughs> what was that? <laughs> I mean, all valid, all valid points. These are the things you will be thinking about and making decisions. Um, uh, praise team, um, youth director, um, several of the ministry leaders will also need to be involved in that process. Because uh, in a lot of cases, they'll be pro square footage. Uh, they'll, they'll be pro wanting more space on the stage as well. So the ideal situation is everybody comes in, they get their voice heard, and um, decisions are based on, um, at some point, a uh, um, concessions being met, made on both sides. Um, concerning the sight lines with the, the portable baptistries, another thing we see a lot of the larger churches doing is they have a camera literally stationed just pointing straight down at that baptistry and it's then being projected up on all the screens. Um, at that point, you're not missing anything. 
Um, as a matter of fact, you've got a, another angle as if you were about 15 feet above them looking down at them. Um, we've had churches who have moved the baptistry um, out into the lobby as a fountain. A Trinity Church here in town, did they do that? Um, so the baptistry's out in the lobby. Cameras, and we've done churches in Fayetteville like this, in Naples, Florida, and in Texas. But the cameras are out in the lobby. The family and friends are out in the lobby during the baptistry, standing up watching. Cameras are hitting that, and it's being projected into the worship center where the praise team is ready to go as soon as the, baptistry's, uh, the baptism's over. And then when the baptism's over, it goes back to praise projections. They start singing, and out in the lobby, family and friends are coming back into the worship center. So again, not telling you to do it that way. I'm just telling you what other churches are doing so that you can consider as many variables as you can consider to make some what will become hard decisions. Yes, sir. See, that's why Halo, what we do, is we'll come in and put case studies in front of the decision makers. Um, we don't tell you what to do. We just show you solutions that have been done. We talk pros and cons. We tell you what we've heard pro about it, what we've heard that they don't like about it from different perspectives. And then it's always your leadership and your committee that makes the decision on behalf of your church. Um, because they're gonna know you way better than we will, even it, with some of the research that we'll do on you. Um, they know your DNA, you guys know your DNA, you know what's gonna work and what's not gonna work. Um, what uh, we like to do is when somebody says, well, no, that's not gonna work because of this, what we'll do is we'll show you some examples of how other churches have done it. We're not telling you, yes, you can, look at this. What we're doing is we're just wanting to make sure that you understand how other churches have solved some of those problems. If it works for you and it's an all over pro, a win-win, again, we don't make that decision for you. You are then armed with the information and the education you need in order to make some valuable decisions for your church. And what you said earlier is correct. Everything's changing so fast due to technology. And even how we worship today compared to how we worshiped literally 10 years ago. I mean, things are changing. I'm not saying we changed the Bible. We're not changing what God has told us we're going to do, what we're responsible for, and what he's holding us to. But the way we worship, that has changed. 
Um, I will say this, I'm a firm believer, and again, I'm coming from a Southern Baptist, uh, traditional Southern Baptist history. I will say this, I've seen churches not get on board with some of the changes, and they're hurting for it. I've seen other churches who have embraced some of the changes, and they're growing leaps and bounds. Now, now when I say that, don't read into that as I'm telling you to get rid of your baptistry. That's not what I'm telling you. What I'm talking about is these are two very similar churches who preach the Bible, okay? Uh, I'm not talking about seeker-friendly churches compared to traditional um, Baptist, Methodist, Church of Christ. I'm talking about two similar denominations. One of them stuck with tradition. One of them adapted. And one is healthy, one is not. Okay? Um, if things have changed, find out what has changed and find out what you can address and not change your bylaws, not change Christianity, not change what you preach from the pulpit. But find out what you can adapt to and look at it. I'm not even saying do it. I'm just saying you've got to take a serious look at it. Are you saying, first of all, we've got tons of experience and tons of ideas what other churches have done to do, to address technology, to address being multi-purpose in their spaces, to address how they use the entire church rather than just one individual space not being used but once a week. I mean, on and on, yes, we could actually do a study on that, and we could do presentations on that, yes. But at this point, what we've been asked to do is address the worship center, and so we will work with the committee and talk to them about what other churches are doing stage-wise, what they're doing audio-visual-wise, and what they're doing lighting-wise and acoustics-wise to improve how they sound, how they look, and how they present the message. Yes? Change the subject. On this stage, it's going to stay that height, and you said coming out. Are those steps on the way? We don't know yet. The steps on the side. Do, do, do not know any design details yet. That, again, that's going to be committee driven. Um, when I say committee, I say team. Uh, we don't really help churches create committees. But uh, it'll be the church team that's working with us that'll help us make decisions on stage design. Uh, getting rid of the steps? Yes. Yeah. What's that? Well, the reason you get rid of the tiers in a lot of design scenarios is so that you gain that square footage to use this stage for all kinds of stuff. If you need the tiered seating, then you have platforms that can be broken down and stored or put back up when you need the tiered seating. And then you can put the same chairs or similar chairs as what you may have out here up there uh, in that place. Um, again, it's going to depend on the ministry, uh, the worship leader, um, on making some of those decisions. But he, he's the one that told us he doesn't need the tears.
close, close. But no, we would not be restricting any exiting. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay, G great question. Um, we've worked with, uh, there's been turnover at the city associated with the ADA. Uh, so naturally, anytime you have newer guys coming in, they're gonna be more strict than the old guys going out. And so we've had 50-50 um, on them requiring us to gain access to this to a platform. Used to be, you could say this is an area of ritual, and so ADA does not apply to that. Um, and uh, to get around it, if they are requiring it, we've got a few options. One of them is a ramp that was mentioned, okay? Another one is a lift, um, that really the lift, what we do is we design those into the overall design of the system so nobody can tell there's a lift over there. And what usually happens is you, you put a tree, a plant, or something on the lift because it hardly ever gets used. It's purely an ADA expense hardly ever gets used. Now, uh, some churches say, Stan, even if we don't have to have ADA access to the stage, go ahead and design it in. And so that would be another thing that we would talk to the church about and, and make sure that we're, first of all, uh, making sure we're going to bat for the church. Because if you do anything ADA to the stage, it's gonna cost more money budget-wise. So if it's important for the church to have access, ADA access to the stage, we'll, we will design it in. And we'll figure out a way to do that and take as little floor space up as possible and balance it with a budget. present the plans to the city based on whatever the church is asking us to do if it's ADA associated with ADA. If they say, hey, we need ADA access to the stage, we'll design it that way, present it to the city, and we've got to figure out the best way to give ADA access to the stage. If the church is saying, no, uh, we don't want ADA access, and when I say ADA access, Please know that stairs are designed for ADA access, okay? The ADA code requires us to design steps a certain way to meet ADA code. No, they don't, there's no handrail, so they're, they're already a strike. But, so when I say ADA access, or somebody says ADA access, they're probably thinking one of two things. One of them they're thinking, well, just ADA access, or two, wheelchair access. Wheelchair access is different. That's when we get into the ramps uh, in most cases, okay? So when we're talking with you and with the leadership and the design committee, we will specifically ask a very detailed question about access to the stage. And then that way we know we're doing what you're asking us to do when it comes to access to the stage. And then we'll go present that to the city, make sure that we've done it in a way that they're going to uh, approve it, and um, we're still able to do it within a budget. Did that answer your question? I mean, so we still need to talk to everybody, find out exactly what they want this stage to act as. Yes, so, so there would then be a portable step system that could be put in place here and put in storage when you're not using it. So if you need center access to the stage, you always have that option. What's that? Oh, y'all do that right now? Yeah. Um, and that's exactly what Aldersgate did. So they got rid of that front staircase. It was just valuable real estate. The, the pastor wanted the pulpit out on the front edge of that, as well as he sits down now and other things. They change it up uh, from one sermon to the other. Couldn't do that with that staircase going up right there that was basically taking it, it recessed into the stage. 
And so what they do now, when they need a center staircase, they have the adaptable uh, mobile uh, step system. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And it actually locks into place. It's not loose. It, it locks onto the stage. Yes, sir. The last church I was a member of when we remodeled the front of the sanctuary and the side top, we took all the tier, tiers out of the front. We expanded just like you're talking about doing here. And we had sets we put up when it was necessary in the front. It was just awesome to be able to have an Easter pageant. <coughs> there on that stage and have everybody on the stage at the same time. And on Sunday when the fire sings, there's tears. <coughs> yes. And just the flexibility is just fine. Yeah. Um, and that's a pretty common solution these days. That, that's, what they, that's what a lot of churches are asking for. The, the best part about what you just said is the, the multi-use part of that. The, the fact that now it's become something that you can use for a lot more things than it was before. Yeah. The band was on one side and the organ piano was on the other Yes. Yes, sir. And again, all we're going to do is throw the ideas out there and we're going to see what you like and what you don't like. And then that's ultimately what would be designed to address what you guys need here at Redbud Baptist. there are a few vendors out there that redo pews and um, uh, the reason I say a few is because they since there are only a few they're expensive yes ma'am here's what I would suggest I know um, here's what I would suggest Maybe you get a bid for redoing the pews and you compare that to putting chairs in so that you can make an educated decision on where y'all go with that. Again, I don't have a vote. <laughs> um, what I will ask the church leadership to do is I will ask them why y'all are making that decision to have a chair vendor come in and put the latest and greatest uh, church chairs in a row somewhere in the church so that people can sit in them, use them, and see what they're all about. Because um, what the survey says now is people, even the, even the traditional, okay, my dad, my mom, will sit in chairs and never recognize that they are chairs compared to pews. Okay, do y'all understand? Uh, if you look at the latest chair designs that people are putting in worship centers, they're the locking chairs. By code, they have to lock together. Um, so what they do is they've now designed those to where the cushions, they don't round off like you're seeing here. They don't do this. There is no separation between the chair at all. If you put the two chairs together, the cushion just continues in a continuous look and feel as what you guys have on these pews right now. Uh, the backs, same thing. When the backs are together, they're a lot more comfortable than what you have right now with these, okay? They've designed them in a way to act identical to pews for two reasons. One, it used to be thought that you could get more people in a pew than you could chairs. Well, if you have chairs like that, the answer is probably correct. But if you have the new design chairs, the answer is 180 degrees opposite. Chairs will allow you to get more people in, and the reason is because your purse is sitting there beside you. 
if you're in a pew and somebody's sitting in there and y'all are starting to squeeze in, what will you do with that uh, purse if you're in a pew? Okay, 80% of the time, women will not move their Bible and purse off the pew. So when people come in and they see that, they don't even want to bother you with it so that you won't move it. So now that means less people getting in the pew. If it's chairs, actual individual seats, and you've put your purse there, and people are starting to fill up and they're looking, you will move it. So psychologically, just the way chairs operate, in a church you can get more people sitting in a row of stacked, oh, sorry, stacked chairs than you can a row, the same size row of a pew. The other reason churches are going stacked chair design is because the space in here now can be used for other things besides just worship that involves 300, 400 chairs. Now you push them aside and have a banquet in here. Now this space becomes a multi-purpose space rather than purely worship. So again, things to think about. I mean, um, y'all may be saying I'm loading one side of the carton here, <laughs> pushing y'all in a certain direction. This is just the stuff that has come up in other churches and these are the things they researched and looked at. And so we have that information. What I'm telling you is look at them. Turn over every stone. Um, you're going to invest a good amount of money into this regardless of what you do. So just make sure that you've done the research, you've looked at it, and you've come into it with an open mind so that you can make a decision that's going to impact the church moving forward. You don't want to handcuff. Or when I started this presentation, I said what we try to do on a design side is we design in a way to open up a lot more opportunities for you to do other stuff in the design. If we designed it in a certain way that handcuffed you into that way for the next 30 years, we didn't do our job. Well, it's the same thing making decisions, even on stuff that architects don't control, and that is the FF&E, the furniture, fixtures, and equipment. It's important that you make good decisions on those because it will have an impact. We will. We will. But our team will recommend a carpet type and design pattern and color that will go with our recommended uh, paint palette but that's not that doesn't mean that's what we're telling you you're going to do what that does is we're going to present that to you and we're going to let y'all vote on it and manipulate it however you want and you'll have our ear and our participation even in you changing it just to make sure that uh, we can guide you a little bit on some of that. We will talk to you about whether or not you want the carpet to be on the stage or whether you want to go with a hard surface on the stage. A lot of churches are going hard surface on stages instead of carpet. But we'll talk to you and we'll talk to you about pros and cons both ways and then that way you can make that decision. Any other questions? All right, thank you. Um, I'm sure, here, I'm going to give this to you, but um, thank you for letting me uh, talk to you about it again. It's not what we're telling you to do. It's what we're, uh, we're going to make some suggestions. We're going to give you a lot of information so that you can make some decisions. It's really just for us to throw the education on the table and let you decide what's going to work with the church and what's not, okay? Thank you, Stan. Appreciate it. And uh, <clears throat> if some of you want to hang out and ask, uh, I think, uh, where's Ron? I thought I saw Ron here. Oh, okay. All right. Any more questions? Uh, let, let me make some really, really quick recommendations. Um, if you have more questions or you've thought about some of the things that Stan has said and, you, and more come up, let me, let me suggest to you highly, if you have a question, write it down or send it to us by text or email because there's no way that they can remember all of that and if you approach them and just tell them well I think and then you know they forget that that's kind of tough uh, I know that uh, Stan his time is valuable and uh, he may have uh, you know to go I know we're all we're all we've been here quite a while 
but uh, if, if he sticks around a little bit and you have a question you might want to ask him that, that that's okay too but um, the, anybody else want to ask us anything or the committee any any anything that we need to discuss okay so what <clears throat> so what we're going to do now is we're going to let you think about those things and we'll talk about when we come back uh, and and have more discussion on that subject uh, committee's got uh, some some things to do as well so we'll let you know exactly when we meet and when we have another discussion there's other people that probably would have been here but the weather kept them and so we might plan you know having an I think we record did we record it James yeah, I don't know how all that will work out we might be able to show that and let people uh, see the presentations at least I don't know about the question and answer part how that all that will work but uh, we'll talk we'll see about uh, showing that to people uh, so they can see what you guys saw tonight okay so <clears throat> let's stand and uh, um, let's have a word of prayer. Qu uh, choir, are y'all doing anything? Or, 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 okay. All right. Thank y'all for being here. Appreciate it. And, um, and uh, we'll see you Sunday, Lord willing. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your blessings. And now, Lord, with the information that we have, I pray now that you would begin to, to guide us and direct us, Lord. And I pray for the, for the committee, Lord. I thank you for what they are doing. And uh, just give them wisdom, Father. Thank you for Stan and for Halo and for his team. Um, Father, we want all want to do what, what you want us to do, and, and uh, we want to do what will be best for Redbud, and not only Redbud today, but Redbud tomorrow uh, and, and years to come. So, Lord, we know that we have a, an important task ahead of us, and so, Lord, I pray that you help us to come together and put together the best plan and the thing that will work and the thing you're leading us to do, Father, and we ask that you do that in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you. And uh, we're going to hang out for a little bit more. God bless.